here, 132, looks like. Did you have a public hearing this morning? No, we well, did not, so well, I guess we can't. Actually, we put out that before we decided to have these here, right. there were no comments until uh, and then we found out we didn't have the resolutions here. So, but we need to do just the regular formal. So, so what? We need to put it on next week's agenda. Oh, okay. And do it regular. And I would suggest that with next week's agenda, um, this week's agenda, read it real quick. Thank you, Ann. I have it in my staff. Um, it states here, uh, public hearing resolutions, um, commission meeting days, office hours and per diem rates, um, it should also say county office hours and then resolution decisions. The intercap, we don't have. Uh, so resolution decisions should say commission meeting days, county office hours, and per diem rates. Um, the resolution that was advertised actually, and I'm glad it's not on the agenda, but it actually said commission office hours, and that needs to be corrected for accuracy. And then take okay, so what, where is this at now? It's, uh, on the agenda. Yeah, but uh, on the last one you said it wasn't right. The uh, legal ad, it stated it was commission office hours. That is, oh yeah, it is there. Mm -hmm. Oh no, commission meeting days and county office hours is what it needs to state, Franklin. Unless you do want to advertise the commission will be in the office full time because that's what you advertised. Full well, commission meeting days, office hours, and per denim rates. Well, what is it you want to do? You have to put county office hours, frankly. Have the word oh, county. Oh, county in front of the office hours. Correct. And then the legal ad needs to state not commission, but county. It's not on the agenda, thank goodness, but it was in the legal act, which is, it, which is incorrect. And that needs to be correct. Otherwise, you are stating publicly that the commissioners will be in the office full time. Okay, so by just putting this on the next one, uh, commission meeting days, county office hours, and per denim rates. Is that correct? Yeah. So what room are you in today? 317A. Back in the old Yeah. <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> Many times. That's the only thing on the agenda is this year. Pardon me? That's the only thing that's on the agenda for, for next week. Um, we also need to add uh, first period, first premier transfer. Uh, Trust Board is asking for a $100,000 drawdown. Okay, just uh, Trust Board transfer then? You better say first premier. Right, first premier bank. $100,000 transfer, and you should put at the beginning of that Broadwater Trust Board. First, first Premier, okay, what's the rest of it now? Um, uh, transfer it needs from Broadwater. to state Broadwater, 
trust board dash, and then after what you already have there, hundred thousand dollar transfer, uh, or it should probably say drawdown. Just transfer, I guess, would be all right. Huh? Transfer. Of funds. I would suggest drawdown for accuracy, because that's what it is. Yeah. Drawdown. Transfer fee. Effects. Excuse me. Drawdown. Transfer. Is that what we need? Read it again. Okay. First premium board trust. From our trust board, draw down. Do we need a... Uh, I suggested $100,000 uh, be in there so that the public knows what we're doing. Draw down. Uh, $100,000. That's all we need on there, then. If you're unsure, you can read it again. First premium, Robert Trust Board, draw down of one hundred thousand. No, we're not going to be. We're not doing this on behalf of first premium, so that needs to go. What it needs to stay first again is Broadwater Trust Board, board. dash. Okay, dash. One hundred thousand dollar drawdown from first premier bank okay. account. How's that? The other thing that should be on there, even though we already took a vote on this, it's not in the agenda. Um, the 11:30 appointment from today uh, it says here: Barton, Levi, DeMartin, tax refund, and mining production penalty and interest forgiveness, and American Innovative Minerals. That does not say that American Innovative Materials is looking for the mining production penalty and interest forgiveness. Um, it states that Bard and Levi DeMartin are. So that should be re-agended so we can re-vote to make it a legal vote. And everything that we're going to make a decision on has to say decision at the end of it. So First Premier has to have a decision. Um, also American Innovative Materials has to have a decision. Well, and on this it says Levi DeMartin dash tax refund. No, it's not a tax refund, it's interest. Right. Yeah, you know, maybe we should re re agenda that one too to make it correct. Well, what's in the minutes what it was? It doesn't matter, Franklin. You know this from the last two years. The agenda has to state what we're doing specifically. can't have it vague. It's got to be specific. <coughs> well, at that time we didn't know if it was a tax refund or what it was. Then it shouldn't have been on the agenda. You need to find those things out before well, you was already on the agenda. There. Then you need to take ownership. This is the agenda for the commission. You're the commission chair. So we need to correct that mistake so that it is not hanging out there. Made another copy of that for you without my chicken scratch. And here's the supporting documents. I thought you might share these. And if you want my chicken scratch, you're welcome to it. No. <laughs> Just <laughs> <coughs> have the decision in the afternoon. You should always have your public meeting and your decision separated by a span of time so you can deliberate on any public comment, Franklin. Not immediately after. And that, of course, comes from Susan Swimley at training. We don't have much other stuff on here. Doesn't matter. You have to show that you're deliberating the information you received. If you receive information, there has to be a space of time, not in the same block. 
So that means there has to be an, a lunch in between or a day or a week in between. Chairman, keep in mind next Monday is 19th, which is a legal holiday. Yeah, it's going to be on the Wednesday the 21st. And you'll need to advertise that we are canceling the 20th because that is a regularly scheduled meeting day, Franklin. Does that come over oh, here? That was more than we saw earlier. Whose house this is? That should be each one's there. So they live on Buddy Lake? Mm -hmm. I have. Yep. And I didn't see the one from WWC. Hmm. I don't remember seeing one, but that doesn't mean it wasn't. So how's the 
how they're going to fix that. No, I guess you're going to she pull the dam out where she originated from. Mm -hmm. Is it in Hardy's ditch? It's, it's an issue. Well, I remember that <coughs> where it goes down through there. You just put a dam in to flood that. That's west of the old Hunsaker place. And this field's there in, in the spring. And apparently they must have had a, a dam in there in, during some of this fall and didn't take it out of So if it goes across the road, does that keep anybody from getting to their residence for cows or anything? Well, if it comes across Lane Lane Road, if you block all the leashes, and if it goes just up over Hospital Lane, they can still go around the other way. Can leashments come in a different way? It could come in from 437. Yeah, they'd have to depending on how far up it's flooding on Buddy Lane. You have to go uh, across on the other side of the place. And, and, and I said, well, I guess it could place get out and go now through the field and get out on Barrett Lane. I imagine. But if it's going across Barrett Lane, then you... Then it might go across there, too. Sometimes well, and the weather's been so crazy this year, that must have play into it too. Well, I suppose, you know how, how uh, like a spring in the mountain, you know, the trees a little bit up on the trees more than keep building, building, you know. That's the same this year. <coughs> Since we have a roll before our next appointment, um, something else that I need to just remind you guys of, um, Sean uh, called also on this, the TSEP grant. We have um, interviews on Wednesday for that grant. We have to get this coming Wednesday? Yeah. We have to get legislative approval. Sean thought it would be effective if all three of us could show up, and he didn't know what time it would. So if you guys are available Wednesday, that would be great to show up. And Possibly offer testimony, possibly just be there as a show of support. And what committee is it going to be before? I don't know. I don't know anything about the time. Um, Sean's going to get that to us, so he'll communicate that to us via email. So did you park at the Capitol Hill and take the bus? No, I parked right at the Capitol. Oh, it was nice. Oh, cool. uh, I was there at 7.35. <laughs> you have to be there early. Yeah. <laughs> We were meeting at 7.30, so I was five minutes late to strategize before. So, but no, right there at the bottom of the steps. It was nice. Aren't those, <laughs> aren't those house seats? Uh, no, no. Um, I walked through their parking lot, but no, right there on the main street. Oh, all right. That is, but, yeah. Six. Yeah. Is that the six? I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> You look confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You to me. <laughs> so we could take the county car and save money on gas mm -hmm. um, on Wednesday if it's available. I haven't checked. Well, that's good. Well, I think the Corey started come on up here. And you ready for me? Yeah, my as well. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I am well. Am I am I the only one that'll be on this, or I don't know if the sheriff's office will? I well, Brenda's here. Well, your your lawyer's not here. Oh. I'll, go. I'll just be listening. Okay, that's good. You don't want to come sit? No, I'll just listen. Do you have the draft documents? Yep. Okay. Somebody's burning toast. 
<laughs> it might be my coffee. I just tried out a brand, brand new coffee maker, and I don't know how good it is yet. So. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Chairman, member of the commission, do you, do you all have the documents I provided to you? Right. And I have I have a couple extra copies here in case. I didn't print for yeah, and I didn't print for us the email. Thank you. I want to share this one too. Oh, I only have one more. Could we get just a copy of the email for now? For sure. Commissioner Gravely? We can share. She and I. Okay. Uh, whatever. Um, How about you and I share? Okay. Oops, sorry. So, here's where we are at this point. I went back, watched all the hearings, or the, 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 the meeting, mainly the, the afternoon meeting. That's where we went. Agreement was detailed. Reviewed every document and various applicable statute. And so, in terms of moving this to final settlement, um, you know, no thing, nothing's ever settled until the draft or until the document signed. And uh, so, so, I have here a draft settlement agreement, um, and, and we can I'll go through that in detail. I'd like to, but uh, a couple things that. I realized as we as I was going through it. First, there were a couple of details I don't have, uh, and I highlighted or commented those in the agreement. Specifically, uh, I think I know the amount of the coroner compensation that was agreed to, but it, but it, in the afternoon that that number was never said out loud on the video. So I I think we're going off of the document that the sheriff's office had provided, and then was was kind of edited by him. The second thing is the Teamsters Union approval document I do not think is accurate. Uh, and it, it appears to be, well, I just don't think it's accurate. It, it, it says that they're um, agreeing to a one-time freeze on the Me Too clause. And I think we all know what the Me Too clause says. But it's, that's not going to work. That's not legal. It, it can't be a one-time freeze. It should be... There should never be another Me Too clause in, a collective, in the collective bargaining agreement between the deputies and the non-bargaining uh, employees. The reason for that is because their pay is, is, has, it's in a different universe from the other employees. Their pay is tied to the sheriff's salary and nothing else, by law. So we can't go forward with the one-time freeze of the Me Too clause. It needs to accurately say the deputy pay is indexed to the sheriff's pay by statute and that's that's it. If we agree to anything else, we're just we're going to recreate the same problem. I'm just going to say we'll be back where we were. No. So the so the union's going to make you off another. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And I'll, I'm happy to recommend that to that. I wanted to talk to you as my client first, but obviously we'll need to do that. Um, and then the second thing that the union agreement has, the second paragraph says the union also agrees with proposal one of the 56 cent raise for all county employees. Um, the raise will be given to the sheriff and then sworn officers will receive the appropriate percentage of the sheriff's salary as allowed for in state statute, in, allowed for in state statute for the deputies. That's not in the agreement. So they, at one point that was discussed, but it appeared to be, as I, I, and in fact I rewatched that video again, it appeared to be when that was discussed it was somebody discussing it, kind of not quite understanding what the deal was, but certainly wasn't anything that the commission agreed to. The reason why is that would upend a lot of the agreement, because the, the, the sheriff's, the proposal that's on the table right now is that the elected officials' uh, salaries are adjusted, including the sheriff, and from that, that adjustment of the sheriff's salary is what then adjusts the deputy's salary to bring that into compliance with the law. Separate from that was the 56 cent per hour raise for the non-elected officials, non-sheriff's uh, office employees. Is that, first of all, 
I'm pretty sure that's where we all are, and I want to make sure that that's your understanding as well. And clerical and detention. Yes, and and I have probably uh, I don't have the best understanding of how the detention uh, employees are the detention employees. They're not part of the sh the deputies' bargaining agreement. Right. That's they are actually. They are. Teamsters covers everyone in the sheriff's department. Okay. But it's just they're sworn and unsworn. So then they That's would the get a, per, just a percentage of this 56 cent, right? That's the part that I need clarified because I, it's not clear coming out of the video from the I mean, that, that that part needs to be clarified. I think the answer is, um, well, I don't even know what the answer is. Brenda's shaking her head no. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think we need that part filled in for us. We had a vote it, during the budget season, so August, September, ish where we agreed to the 56 cent of raise for everybody the county compensation board suggested it for elected officials and as practice we extend that to all employees um, the only thing that would change on that is that sheriffs or uh, the sheriff's deputies would make not 57 56 cents but a percentage of hers 56 cents whatever that ends up being 90 percent and on down 95 and on down so the detention would be the same way no, not. So is not a percentage. So is no, none of oh, the detention okay. personnel are considered sworn deputies except for a captain? For example, correct. captain. Is that correct? Yes. Nobody else in the detention uh, system. It's not system. They're not in the system. They're running the system. Run the system. Okay. That was the, that was the part that was clear. So, it was your intention, as commissioners, to include the fifty-six cent per hour raise for the detention employees, except for Captain Corvo, and he's covered under the deputy pay. Mm -hmm. Is that your intention? Yes, it was mine. Uh, yes, I'm getting more and more confused here. <laughs> So we kind of we kind of got let's just do three boxes here. Okay, actually we're going to have four boxes. Box one is elected officials. Box two is deputies. Box three is um, sheriff's office employees who are not deputies. Okay. Okay. And box four is all other county employees. Corey, if you want to make it easier, you can look at it sworn and non-sworn in my office. Okay. And so sworn, sworn is? Sworn is a percentage. Non-sworn is non-percentage. Okay. Would you tell me what we've got in the boxes again, please? Box number one is the elected officials that are covered by this. And, and I did not, for the purposes of the agreement, include county commissioner pay in the agreement. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fine? Yeah. No. That's not fine. Because um, I sent you the statute 503, I think, 7-4. Um, even though we're not included in the statute um, that you had included in this um, document, there is another statute that says that the county commissioners are paid based on the clerk and recorder salary. So okay. we're, we're included even though they didn't list us in one statute. Okay. So this is why it's a draft. So box one, elected officials, um, that will not include the county attorney. I mean, I'm not in that box. Count, or box two, the, but, let me go back. The elected officials box does include the sheriff, because the agreement will set her salary. Uh, box two, the sworn personnel in the sheriff's office. Box three, the non-sworn personnel in the sheriff's office. And then box four, all other county employees. So, let's 
Let's start with the easy ones, boxes three and four. The non-sworn personnel in the sheriff's office and the all other county attorneys, they will receive a 56 cent per hour raise effective July 1, 2014. Is that accurate? Yes. Box two should include deputies that are uh, not with the sheriff's office, and that would be um, clerk of court as a deputy, Doug will have a deputy, and Kirk has a deputy, and they make 90%. Right? Right now, Doug does not have a chief deputy, so. No, but but he's planning on it, so. They make 90% of the elected official they work with. Exactly. What's with that? Let's make that its own box. Thanks, Sam. So they're not sheriff, they're not deputies like they think of sheriff's deputies, they're deputy yeah, officials. Deputy they're deputy, deputy officials. Yeah, like they're a deputy court. county attorney. Deputy officials. And every one of them, that's one thing I didn't research. So every one of them you're saying is 90% of the elected officials pay. Yes. Base pay? Yes, yes, everything's off base. So we're going to say, we're going to call it elected of 90% of the principals base pay. All right, so we have, we're going to call that uh, box two. So now box one is the elected officials. I'm remembering my boxes. <laughs> box two are the deputy officials. Box three are the deputies that are sworn, the sworn personnel in the sheriff's office. Box four, the non-sworn personnel in the sheriff's office. And box five, all other county employees. So going back to boxes four and five, the non-sworn personnel in the sheriff's office and all other county employees, they are supposed to receive 56 cent per hour raise effective July 1, 2020. That's yes. Okay. So let's go to the draft agreement. I have a question. <clears throat> Fine. Right, we can come back. I'll, I'll just confirm this over there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this thing from the Teamsters and with it saying about the Me Too. We need a new sheet there, do we not? I believe we do. But yes, I believe we do. So let's. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So then, let's go to elected officials, box one, and in the draft agreement, and I'm gonna open the statute so we can all see this as well. The statute is 7-4-2503. And Salary schedule for certain county officers. Um, now, first of all, I, I'm not familiar with quite how all the offices are combined in Broward County because I know they're some are combined, some aren't. So, I I, I believe I left somebody out. I know you just gave them two separate jobs. Two separate jobs. Yeah. Okay, so let's clarify that. Let's let's start with the sheriff. Under this agreement, I believe what it's saying is, and I believe it's saying effective July 1, 2014. Is that correct for the changes of the salaries? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Sheriff's base pay, $46,000. This is under 2503. And then an additional two thousand dollars under twenty five hundred three two B, and I'll just read it to you. The county sheriff must receive, in addition to the salary based upon subsection one, the sum of two thousand dollars a year. 
So all these county officials start at parity, and then there's immediate, the first exception is to the sheriff gets an additional 2,000, and that doesn't violate the parity provision. Plus longevity pay according to section 2503-2C, and that one says, the county sheriff must receive a longevity payment amounting to 1% of the salary determined under subsection one for each year of service with the sheriff's office, but years of service during any year in which the salary was set at the level of the salary of the prior fiscal year may not be included in any calculation of longevity increase. This, hence the confusion over longevity, right? The additional salary amount provided for in this section may not be included in the salary for purposes of computing the compensation for under sheriffs and deputy sheriffs as provided in 7 4 25 8. So, whatever that ultimate number is that sheriff, uh, the sheriff will get from or base plus 2,000 plus longevity, the plus longevity portion is not included to hit the 90% mark for, for deputy or 95% mark for uh, under sheriff. Does that make sense? Yes. Because, for what obvious reason? Because the sheriff's longevity payment is gonna go up every year. And if, if it goes up every year and we're constantly indexing uh, for the deputies, then what you've done is not just reward the sheriff for longevity, you've rewarded everybody in the sheriff's office for longevity, even if it's their first year on the job. So you can't include the longevity every year to do those percentages. So do we agree that those are the right numbers? 46,000 base pay, pay for the sheriff plus $2,000 um, plus longevity for the sheriff's salary. Okay. Oh, now, what about where does the coroner pay come in? The, so the coroner will be an additional item. Okay. We'll, we'll get to okay. it later. Um, the, next, the next elected official is clerk and recorders slash elections administrator. So is our clerk and recorder and elections administrator combined? Mm -hmm. Yes, with treasurer and superintendent of schools. Or hats. It says so. And a okay, so we're back to the base pay in the statute, $46,000 for a clerk and recorder and election administrator. Now, under 2503-2D, the statute says, if the clerk and recorder is also the county election administrator, the clerk and recorder may receive, in addition to the base salary provided above, up to $2,000 a year. <clears throat> this additional salary may not be included for purposes of compensation, comp account computing the compensation of any other county officers or employees, okay? So the, I think two, this is important for two reasons which we'll get to. So first of all, they are combined. <clears throat> if, does, does, the agreement right now doesn't say, and your discussion didn't say, whether the commission wishes to give an additional $2,000 because the offices are combined. I wrote this so that if you choose to do that today or next year, that will not void the agreement. What I wrote was, this agreement does not prevent the commission from approving the optional additional $2,000 for this combined office under 2503-2D. And such additional payment shall not be deemed a violation of this agreement. So this agreement won't lock you in to add the additional two or to, or to, to not add it. Currently, is the additional $2,000 added? I under the terms? Yeah, I'm not positive of the structure. Anymore. Okay. Well, we can do it outside of this agreement. Okay. All right. Now, going back to box two, deputy officials. Deputy officials include the 90% of the principal's base pay, correct? However, this section says, the additional salary provided for in this subsection may not be included as salary for the purpose of, comp of computing the compensation of any other county officers or employees. The deputy goes off the base pay of 46000 to get 90%. We're prohibited from using the 48000 the additional 2000 to calculate that 
we all agree on that? Okay. Well, I didn't understand it until today. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> I thought it was a big well, deal. If you don't have to live through it. <laughs> so, if we're fine with that section, we can go to the next next one. Now, forty-six thousand dollars for the treasurer. Now, these are combined, so uh, this gets a little bit trickier. Twenty-five hundred three two D. It should be 2E. So in this draft, it should be 2E, not 2D on page 3. But 2E says, the county treasurer may receive, in addition to the base salary provided for in subsection 1A, up to $2,000 a year. The additional salary may not be included to calculate anyone else that's likely just did. The statute doesn't appear to say whether the county commission can do since we have a person that's with multiple combined offices, could they do the additional 2000 for combining offices under Section 2D, plus an additional 2000 for the treasurer under 2E? You'll note that the provision that says the treasurer gets another two, may get another $2,000, it doesn't say that it's because of a combined office. It just says you may do it if you want to. I think what it means is that the commission could take this combined officer, clerk and recorder, elections administrator, treasurer, superintendent of schools, and assessor. You could start with a 46,000 base pay. I think you could, you know, I know you could add a $2,000 for the combined office of the election administrator. I think you could buy, add another 2,000 for treasurer. I would like to <coughs> run that by Mike Seastad, though, before I told you the final answer. But I think that's what can happen. But these are all combined in one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have been since the mid-90s. Okay. Apparently, in retrospect, not a real smart idea. Oh. <laughs> There's been some discussion about addressing that. There's two counties, Lewis and Clark and us, that do that, I guess. No, Missoula. Oh, Missoula too? All right. So Doug does all of it. Yeah. All right. So I owe you the answer on that. I'm not, and I think that's that you could go 46 plus 2 plus 2. I would need to talk to Mike. It's easy to Okay. Either way. What I will do is redraft this so that I put all those offices combined in one subsection of the agreement. And with your approval, I will also draft it so that if you choose to add the 2,000 or add the 4,000 or add none of them, that it won't in any way affect the agreement with everything else. Is that, is that okay? Yes. Now sub D. The clerk of district court, forty-six thousand dollar base pay for the clerk of district court. So E, forty-six thousand dollar base pay for the justice of the peace. Here's what I added, and I and I'll tell you why. I added forty-six thousand for the base pay um, for justice of the peace, provided this agreement does not prevent the commission from approving the payment of additional funds to the Office of the Justice of the Peace or for salary to the Justice of the Peace pursuant to the combined duties of the Justice of the Peace and the Townsend City Judge as permissible under law, and such additional payments shall not be deemed a violation of this agreement. The reason I put this is because uh, I'm not convinced that, I, I believe there's a way that the county can allow the additional compensation for City Judge to go directly to the Justice of the Peace. There's an AG's opinion that I just got from Mike Seastad. Um, it was actually when he was on vacation, it was just very recently, that sets, addresses this exact same situation in another county in, 19, or in 2009 and says that if the interlocal agreement allows it and if the county commission approves it, that the additional payment for, for the city judge duties could go either to the Justice of the Peace budget 
the office for the combined duties or to the justice of the peace, either one. Because the way the statutes are written, the general statute saying you can't double pay for duties that are ha basically happening in the same business hours. The AG's office says that that is refined or clarified when you go to the specifics of the Justice of the Peace City Judge statute and that the specific rules over the general. I need a little more work on that. I'd like to go through that again with Mike Seastead. It's an issue for a different discussion. The point is I drafted this so that in the event the commission wants to make that change later, they won't violate this agreement. That's, that's, that's as far as we need to go on that today. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> now, who have I left out for elected officials? County the commission. commission based on, yeah, that other statute. And then anybody else? No, that's all. Unless you would address something compensation for superintendent of school. I have no idea what he's getting now. Whatever it is, it isn't enough. Yeah. Is it just treated as the combined office as well? It's mm -hmm. not as the general yeah. mm -hmm. The superintendent doesn't have an additional $2,000 payment. The mm -hmm. statute provides additional $2,000 for the sheriff, for the administrator or clerk and recorder, for elections administrator for one they're combined and for the treasurer. Those are the only three additional, whatever you call them, uh, payment provisions. And, and I don't know historically what has been done with the additional duties. I don't have the okay. answer to that. Oh, it's kind of odd that they even require that, <clears throat> that office. That's a, that's a throwback to the old days, I think. Okay, well, with that, with that, we'll move to the next section. So the next section is the sheriff setting the base charge for the deputies. And I listed it this way because that's what the statute says. The sheriff sets the pay. Now, and I, I included as the base pay $46,000 plus the $2,000. The reason I did that is because it explicitly says for longevity, you do not include longevity for calculating for deputies. And then when you look at the treasurer and the combined uh, elections administrator and clerk and recorder, in those two provisions it says you do not use the additional money to calculate pay for other people. This one, where you add $2,000 for the share, it doesn't say you don't exclude it for other people. I believe that means you include it because if the legislature intended to say you don't include it, they demonstrated they can do that for other offices and other situations and they didn't do it here. So I believe that the base pay calculation for deputies should be 46,000 plus two. So 48 and then they take a percentage of that. Is that your understanding? Yes. Do you want to say, if, you don't have to say if that's your understanding? The, the base is 48? Yeah. That was my understanding. That's, okay. Now, we're just rocking and rolling. All right. So, base pay, 48000 effective July 1, 2014. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. Okay. Compensations rate, under sheriff, 95% or 45600 base. Captain, 90% or 43200 base. Sergeant, 88% or 42240 base. Senior deputy over five years of experience with the sheriff's office, 87% for 41,760. There was a lot of discussion whether that should be five years or seven years. The, what I understood from the, and it was hard to hear this part of the video. It sounded to me like they reached the agreement on five years and then the notes from uh, County Attorney Bossy had seven years scratched out and five years on the sheet that was the counter proposal from the sheriff. So am I accurate to go with five years rather than seven? I haven't got to that one yet. Oh, okay. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll fix that. Um, is the five years accurate? Do we all agree on that? Yes. Okay. Do we all agree on 95% for the under sheriff, 90% for the captain, 88 for the sergeant, 87 for the senior deputy, and then the next one, non-probationary deputy with less than five years experience uh, with the sheriff's office shall receive 86% or 41,280. Those, those are all good? Yes. Okay, probationary deputy, 85%. And I wrote the number wrong. It's not 40,000, it's 40,800. All right. If that's good, we'll go to the next section. Next section says the parties acknowledge all future pay raises, pay raises to, and it shouldn't be Broadwater broad, broad County Sheriff's <coughs> Office personnel. It should be sworn personnel. Is that right? Yeah, yes. I think so. Sworn personnel, not including the sheriff. I'll figure out how to word that. Shall be linked exclusively to the sheriff's pay in accordance with the statute 7 4 2508 and shall not be linked to pay raises of any other county employee. The parties acknowledge any commission resolution, budget, or wage proposal by, set by the sheriff or any collective bargaining agreement that establishes, and I will fix the sworn part, the sworn personnel wages contrary to this section of the statute is null and void and without legal effect. Are we all comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Other than my wordsmithing. Then the next section. The commission shall authorize the payment of, and this seemed to be what the final agreement was. But this coroner portion was never said audibly. It was, it, everyone was pointing at some paper. I believe it said, the commission, or we agreed, or you agreed, the commission shall authorize the payment of $3,800 for, $3,804 per year for the coroner and $3,424 per year for each deputy coroner. coroner. Uh, now, there was discussion of the $2,000 level and then there was this paper at the numbers that I just read. What do you understand that you approved? The 3804. The 3804 and the 3424? Right. Same as what we have on this. Okay. Does I that... agree. I still I still am going to support the 2000 and 1800 that Mike Saystaff had recommended. But yes, we did agree to the 3804. So, so we agree it was a two to one vote for this higher level, even though you personally opposed that level, you agree that was what the approval was? Yes, okay. that was the approval. Okay. Now, I just threw this in. And, and I don't know if this was part of the agreement. It was kind of implied, but nobody said this. But I put a sentence. In order to receive this compensation, individuals must be coroner qualified, maintain their qualification, and perform coroner duties as assigned. Uh, if the, so it's the sheriff's the coroner and has to supervise them. If you want to recommend a, an adjustment to that sentence, uh, I'm wide open to that. Or your lawyer, through your lawyer. But um, is, it, is, that, is that accurate? They have to be qualified. They have to be coroner qualified to receive the payment, and they have to, if they lose qualification somehow, then the payment stops. Okay. And then if there's a, if they haven't done a single coroner call in a year, and they've always said they were out fishing, I assume at some point they're going to have they're going to be in trouble. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll leave it in there unless I hear differently. Now, the coroner payment is effective July 1, 2014. Is that accurate? Yes. I think where we are is that on number five, the commission already had a budget provision increasing these wages. So you don't have to adopt it. You have to implement what you already approved. 
Is that correct? Correct, mm -hmm. yes. And that, and I just need to clarify that that's, that's not going to be for all non-elected officials. I need to reword that based on what we did earlier with the deputy elected officials, correct? Yes. So it's going to be, let's just clarify who it's going to be. It's going to be boxes four and five. It's going to be sheriff's office, non-sworn employees, and it's going to be all other county employees, boxes four and five, not elected officials, not deputy officials, and not sworn deputies. Okay. Incorrect. Okay, tell me. The vote was for everybody, uh, and in for those other deputies to get any raise, the electeds have to. Um, also, Mike Saysad was pretty explicit that it's a good idea to go ahead and implement the 56 cents for everybody, because the deputies with the most experience in the sheriff's office, <clears throat> their increases are minuscule, about $500 a year, whereas the new deputies got about $3,000 a year increases. So it's a way to help morale a little bit for those deputies. Okay, so let's, let's just start with what, what was the agreement. I don't know if, either I didn't understand this or I don't know that that was part of what was actually, that, that you voted on on the 22nd or whatever day it was. Did, did the commission understand that they were voting to, I guess, in stages? First, set the elected officials at 46,000 plus the various adjustments. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, subsequently, give those same elected officials a 56 cent per hour raise on top of it. Yes. Yeah, I guess I was, I was against 56 cent deal, but that's... Let's hear her say. Voted no. But it was a 2 1 vote. It was a 2 1 vote to say we're going to set the sheriff at 46,000 plus adjustments, all these others at 46,000 plus adjustments, and then immediately add the 56 cent per hour for all of them. Understanding, however, that the 56 cent raise was approved months ago before this solution was ever understood or proposed. Um, but we never did take the 56 cent raise off the table for anyone. We left it on. So, yes. I, so I, I think to make it clear, it would make sense to actually s do two resolutions. Okay. Because uh, it's not clear from any of the video that that's what you intended or that that's what you actually voted on. To, to do the, the basis <coughs> there, the, and the, the 56 cent per hour raise for the other employees is clear. What isn't clear is that elected officials weren't inclu were included in that 56 cents. And so from drafting purposes, it wouldn't, you kind of, which one comes first? You know, the, um, if we say the 56 cent per hour raise, that may or may not be at 46,000 for all these, for all these offices. I hear you. So let's say we say it's 56 cent per raise, and let's or 56 cent per hour, and let's say that went to uh, 51,000, and then we immediately say 46,000. So we've just negated the previous raise. Or if we say no, it's 46,000 base plus all the others. Um, I would recommend we just make it clearer and figure out what that level is and do it one time. One thing with the 56 cent raise, the co compensation board wanted to raise electeds by $2.40 an hour, I think is what they came up with. Um, that would have still not been quite um, this amount, this base. So if we say the base instead of the 56 cents, um, then it's really negating the 56 cents, um, which we can certainly discuss, but the deputies are the ones <coughs> not getting the increase. They're just getting the structured increase here without any additional raise. The guys, which deputies do you mean? Well, when, for example, on, um, on <clears throat> this was taken from Mike's worksheet and it doesn't have the increases. I didn't bring mine, but when is under sheriff is only increasing by I think $528 per year for this, with this whole deal. Um, that's substantially less than the 56 cents per hour would give him. Uh, the newest deputy um, was increasing by about 3,000 per year. So the morale issue 
is going to hit when one gets 500, who's been here for 15 years, and someone who's almost new, it's 3,000. Um, so <coughs> that, I think, is the reason that Mike suggested keeping the 56 cents after all this. Um, Here's Mike's proposal. And I, 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 I'm not, you don't need to convince me. You tell me what what you want to do. That part of that part of the agreement is not at all clear from the record that's, that I have. It's, granted, it's not a good record. So if that's what you intend, let's go ahead and clarify it. And I would recommend, here's this if you want to look at it. I would recommend either do that calculation of what that would be, what, what that number should be for elected officials. And let's just set that in the agreement so it's clear and everyone else will index accordingly if if 46,000 for the sheriff is not enough in the commission's opinion to give other people the raise they want then the cleanest way to do it is to make that a higher number rather than do 46 and then add on immediately a, a raise a per hour raise but so what I'm trying to do I'm not trying to tell you how to do it or I'm not trying to to disagree, what I recommend we do is let's just reach clarity on exactly what you want to accomplish, and then I'll help get the, the language to, to make that step simple. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, because Mike is far more, in a way, more eloquent than I am, I'm just going to read what he said. Um, he just gives a couple of options. One, give the raise. Two, don't give the raise. And of course, we can do what Corey's suggesting. But what he said was, um, with the option of do not give the raise, but give all other employees except the deputy sheriff's the raise. Since deputies' wage are tied to the sheriff's wage by statute, not giving the 56 to the elected officials, results in the sheriff's and deputy sheriff's wages staying static. Um, since the raise is for the higher rank, are nominal under the proposal, my recommendation is to grant the raise to the elected officials and increase the compensation of the undersheriff and deputies to reflect in bold the appropriate percentage of the sheriff's salary. On bold, just the wage raise is granted to the sheriff and undersheriff at the proper MCA. Um, I paraphrase there at the end. But um, so that's kind of why we got stuck on the 56, but really if you think about it, we take the 56 cent raise off the table, again, I think our, our top people here in the Sheriff's Department are the ones most affected because our deputies in the clerk of court, or, or the clerk of court and the JP's office are popping up based on 90% of the official they work for who's popping up based on this agreement. Um, so it, it really does put a whole different twist into just the elected official side of this. I hadn't even thought about that, so thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Yes. So, so you're basically saying take the 46,000 divided by 2080 find out what the hourly pay is, and add 56 cents to that, and then base all the other salaries, all the sworn salaries off of that, everyone in, and everyone else gets a 56 cent number raise. Is that basically what you're saying? Uh, well, what I'm saying is, uh, I just want to draft whatever was agreed on. No, I, at this I, point, I'm not clear on what that is. So, okay. what, but, but that's kind of what you're getting, set the base salary, including the 56 cents per hour. And then, then go off from there, rather than go back and add 56 cents in after everything's set. Is that kind of... I'm saying if, if the intention is to set, set the number at a level, and the whole point of this was to set the sheriff's compensation at a level where the deputies fell within the statutory range. This this number does that. Forty six thousand does that. So you could say, boom, we're setting the level at forty six thousand, and then the, the other the high, high, things that add by, by statute. Everyone else falls in place, and that's sufficient to settle this lawsuit. If the commission wants to still give people a raise, it doesn't have to happen under the decision to settle the lawsuit. 
it can be the next decision. Now that we've settled it, here's our number. Next week or next month, we're going to approve a raise. And then we'll have set in the framework of how, people, how those raises affect their deputies and everybody else. Uh, that, that's what could happen now. Or that would be really easy to do. Um, and that also goes back to the issue of the 56 cent per hour raise for the other county employees and the unsworn employees. Because at this point it's clear that the collective bargaining agreement is not requiring you to use the Me Too clause. You can do that raise uh, when, when you need to. Outside of this settlement document. I guess where I was going with all this is that the commission is likely going to have to redo the budget process um, and do a budget resolution because there are a lot of numbers here for salaries that were not in the October 6th budget resolution. So you'll have to go through that process to authorize that spending. Um, it'd be really easy if, if there's additional raises to do it at that point. The one that doesn't need to be on, doesn't need to wait until then, is 56 cents per hour for elected officials or the other county employees because it was already included in the budget. It was just put on hold by the lawsuit. So that could go forward. What wasn't clear to me was whether you intended to set it at 46,000 base and then do the additional raise on top of that. And if that's your intention, then then I can draft. I can draft it so that you can proceed with that and this agreement won't be considered a violation or having to violate it. Does that make sense? That was yeah. more that was more convoluted than it needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't I do this? Why don't I draft the, the options, the two options? Should I do that? Yeah. That's what I'm sure. Corey a question on that. Um, if we, how long will this take roughly, do you think, to get approved? If the 56 cents is hinging on this, then I think that's one route that we want to consider. If we take the 56 cents totally out of this, so it's standalone, and implement that now, <clears throat> then that's another route to consider, right? Um, that way the employees get their raises sooner, right? And essentially electeds get no additional 56 cents because the pop-up goes beyond that. Okay. I think the answer is you could, you could vote uh, as soon as you notice a meeting to do the 56 cent per hour raise for the non-sworn employees in the sheriff's office and the other county employees you could do the elected officials, but then it's going to be immediately overridden by whatever we said. Okay. There's two possible risks with that. One, you've got a union that immediately files something to stop it because it violates the Me Too clause. I'm willing to run that risk because their Me Too clause is clearly in violation of the law, and no judge is. I mean, I don't think Judge Reynolds is going to going to stand up there and say, "You're, you're, you're I'm, here's an, I'm ordering an injunction." But it might make sense since we're very close to the union saying, go ahead and do that. They've already said go ahead and do it, but their agreement, their, their, their document's probably flawed. Bottom line is, I'm not worried about the union coming in and saying you can't give a pay raise to the employees. The union, the, the bargaining unit here clearly wants you to be able to do that. The, the other possible, um, no, that's probably about it. That's probably about it as far as the risk. And, and if, uh, if it's all done in the spirit of implementing this agreement, it'd be really easy to notice it, have a union rep here, and even if we haven't signed everything with this agreement, I think the commission could move forward with that, implementing that raise, and I wouldn't be worried about it. Makes sense. We would still have to do a budget 
provision, though, to set the deputies, the, the sworn sheriff personnel, and the elected officials. So um, even, even, even that will take a little while, I know, but with the effective date of July 1, everyone knows that they're getting back pay at some point. But making that amendment, it would be a, a, a bunch of process and a way to resolution that would still need to be done. And I didn't go through that with all of you, so I don't know how long that takes, but I think it takes a little while. Yeah, whatever it takes, it takes, I guess. Yeah, it wouldn't take too long at all. A couple weeks. So what paragraph five was intended to say was that the commission would basically unfreeze the, the increase, the raise for boxes four and five of personnel. That's what it was intended to say, so I'll reword that. And then the commission, whatever you decide to do in terms of the elected officials, either we just set it at the set it at the base that you want it to be at to give effect to the other bases below them. I think that's the cleanest way to do it. And then if you want to add an additional way raise on there, keep in mind at that point we're probably going back through the compensation board. So my, the easiest way to do it, the cleanest way to do it is set that number in this agreement that gives you raises you want, and then let's not do another elected official raise until we go back to the county compensation board process. That'd be the, that would be the easiest way to do it. And there's one decision there, not multiple, that kind of sequentially follow each other. However, if you want to do it the other way, then I'll draft the documents accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> I would personally prefer uh, keeping it separate, even if it means convening the compensation board again. And the reason why is it's cleaner. I like sticking with the numbers that Mike presented to us uh, rather, rather than fiddling with those. Um, we already approved the 56 cents. It's clear. It's already public. Um, you know, it's already got a, a certain amount of support. Um, I think if we start adding numbers, then it opens the door to too many questions and assumptions that are not correct. Um, so I think just for clarity and communication's sake, keeping the two separate is the way I'd, I'd prefer. That makes sense. So what I understand you're telling me to do is to set the base at 46000 and with the additional adjustments. That will be sufficient for the purpose of this agreement. Right. And then the commission will, may, may do it or may not do it, but implement the additional 56 cent raise or whatever, but it will be a subsequent step outside of this agreement and I don't need to worry about that. Is that accurate? I think so, <laughs> okay. yes. All right, I will do that. Truthfully, paragraph five doesn't need to be in this agreement because uh, the only reason I would have this in the agreement is, is to help tie the union not objecting to this raise to the settlement of this. I think it makes sense to tie them to this so that they don't say, okay, it's fine, orally, you grant the foot raise, and then we're back to fighting over the Me Too clause again. So I'd like to keep it in the agreement for that reason. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. It's paragraph six. The commission does not admit the Broadwater County 2015 budget process and the budget resolution of October 6, 2014 violated the Montana Local Government Budget Act, etc. The commission affirmatively commits to adhering to the, the provisions of the Budget Act as it prepares an amended budget for 2015 to implement this agreement and for all future budgets. The commission fir further affirmatively commits to providing all Broadwater County departments and elected officials the most accurate and timely information in order available in order to assist them with preparing their proposed budgets. This paragraph six is intended to deal with the allegation that the whole process didn't have all the right notices and that the that there was a, a lack of cooperation in terms of preparing the sheriff's office budget. The commission, because we because the, the show cause hearing uh, is being vacated and we're not going to court over this, the commission doesn't need to, nor should it, acknowledge any wrongdoing. 
Why? Not just for this, but for other, any other possible complaints that are out there. Because all other complaints, they have a 30-day window after the budget resolution is passed to bring forward those complaints. We're beyond that. However, if the commission signs a public document saying you violated the Budget Act, a really artful lawyer is going to <coughs> try to challenge the budget in some other way and say, Judge, you don't have to, I don't have to get the 30-day window under statute. I now need to be within 30 days of them admitting they did something wrong. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You don't need to admit you did anything wrong. We're settling the case. At the same time, the complaint seemed to be focused on, one, the full compliance with all the notice provisions of the Budget Act, and two, ensuring that there's effective communication between county government departments to help everybody prepare their own budget. So what I'm trying to do is say, we're not going to admit we did it wrong. However, the Commission commits itself to following the Budget Act's procedural processes and the best information that's available will be provided so that departments can prepare their own budgets. There's not a requirement in the law that you are 100% perfect or accurate all the time. You're accurate to the best of your ability because Congress screws up the budget most of the time. So it's, it's not as if 100% accuracy has to be provided. It has to be the information, the best that's available. So that's what the purpose of this paragraph six would be. I, I haven't heard back from the sheriff's office on this one whether there's any requested adjustments, but that's that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this. But if, if there's things that uh, we did wrong, will that come on down the line? What about where the, the judge said we had to redo that budget? And he, and that is a, the judge didn't rule that the county did anything wrong. What the judge ruled was, based on the only one side of the story that was presented to him, it appeared likely or possible or whatever the word, whatever standard we want to throw in there, that there was a violation here. The county has to either do all the things that the sheriff's office asks or <clears throat> come to a hearing and present your side of the story. That's it. It's, it was not a final ruling on the merits that the county did anything wrong. It was saying, comply or come tell me why you already complied. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm not convinced, I, I know that there's opinions floating out there about that all these things were violated. I'm not convinced that that's the case. I think there was, I think there was adequate notice. I think there was, uh, there were, even if there was a lack of notice on one or two, if there were, there, those were cured by follow-on notices. And uh, it doesn't matter. We don't, need to, we don't need to fight over that. We're settling the case. We don't need to sit here and argue over who shot John. That's what the purpose of this paragraph six is for. And then paragraph seven, the Broadwater County Sheriff's Office affirmatively commits to communicating and working in good faith with the commission and relevant staff to seek and prepare its budget with the most accurate and timely information. What I'm trying to do is capture both sides here. The commission commits to providing the best information possible. The Sheriff's Office commits to preparing its budget and work cooperatively to make it happen. So, Let's not fight over it. Let's both sides commit to progress in the future. Uh, paragraph eight, the commission agrees to hire a mutually approved independent accountant to calculate the wages for the sheriff's office personnel to implement this agreement. I, I recommend we don't do this. I don't know that we need to do this. And this, there's a big price tag attached to this entire agreement. I think the county can save some money. However, that's not my decision. That's the commission's decision. And if the commission wants to hire the person go forward with it. Uh, but there are people in this county whose full-time job, in this office, full-time job is to do this. And if the, someone wants to check our math, then I think they should pay, pay for the checking of the math. That's, that's my opinion. Again, that's your decision though. But, but I want to highlight it because it doesn't make sense. And it goes kind of hand in hand with number nine. The commission further agrees to conduct an independent audit of all wage calculations for the past 10 years in order to determine the sources of errors. This, I strongly recommend, number nine is deleted. And the reason for that is it's gonna be extremely costly. Number two, I don't see what, I know what further purpose it was offered for, and I don't think that purpose is going to help the resolution of this case. The, 
that what was discussed multiple times on the video was this audit was was being offered and provided for so that the county could look at any back wage claims against the sheriff or against some of the deputies who were overpaid, which would go back three years. Well, if we're going to do that, we're not settling this case. Then we're back fighting. And, this, and if the idea is to settle and put all those things to rest, then this audit serves no purpose. And if the audit is, is there's another idea out there that the audit may be useful for another case, well then that audit should be done under the auspices of that other case and not under the auspices of this case. So my recommendation is that number nine be deleted. That, that's actually a very strong recommendation. Number eight, um, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't feel that strongly about it either way. Number nine, I think, is potentially a poison pill for the entire agreement. I agree. I, I'm more than happy to take out both. Um, number nine for sure. I did ask Debbie. I said, Debbie, tell me honestly, point blank, is this something you can do or do you have any reservations at all? She said, my answer is yes, I can do this. Um, she can. She's done a good job. She is fairly new in the position, um, but really she has, she's done very well under very difficult circumstances. I have all the faith in the world in her that she can do this. Okay. Great. <clears throat> no, I guess it rest on her. She says she can do it. And, and then number nine, the 10-year audit. Uh, get it out of there. I agree with you as a poison pill, and I, I think that um, what you say makes sense on that. superficial the way I feel on them. If you want to have one, let's say a, a forensic audit. I guess, so what, what do you mean between a, an audit and a forensic audit? What, do you, what would be the difference? Well, for what? Being new to the auditing world, well, as I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is what uh, <coughs> Selstead one time said, you want an audit, you got to have a financial. Forensic audit. Did I say what did I say? Financial. You forensic. said forensic. 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 Yeah. Okay. Or the, these other audits, they just kind of things balance out. That's about it, really. So if that's all we're going to have, I, I'd be, I'd say no. But if we wanted to have a good one and have a forensic audit, which is expensive, but I maybe, maybe comment, you should. A forensic audit is looking for fraud. Is looking for fraud, and you were talking big bucks doing that. I see. Personally, I see no reason to go that. Way. Nobody's saying there's any fraud here. No, I have to agree with that. I agree too, and that's, again, I will reiterate, let's take nine out of there, let's take eight out of there. I think both of them are roadblocks to moving forward. We don't need that anymore. We need to move forward. Was there a, was there a further reason for the 10-year audit aside from the discussion about uh, back, back pay? Was it so we don't mess this up again, or what, which it's clear what messed it up again, the 2008 collective bargaining agreement. This goes back two CBAs, not one, uh, the, the percentages. So it, that's what started the whole problem with the deputy pay being out. Um, mm -hmm. But is there another reason for the audit beyond, if it's outside the scope of this, then even if it's a good idea to do it, I would recommend it not be included in this agreement. And that's what I wanted to. Yeah, I don't think, I think it would be in the scope of this, I don't believe. Okay. I don't think we need it. Okay. Now, now and those aren't decisions because we haven't noticed this, but what I will do then, when, when I come back to you, we, sh we should do it, uh, no later than next Monday. Uh, I will have everything that's with the adjustments you recommend, but it won't be, we'll have to notice for the decision, and, and your decision then will adopt these changes that we discussed. So these are just, at this point, so preparation to make the decision here. Okay, I'm, I, I know, sorry. Next Monday is 19th, which is a holiday, and I believe the meeting's going to be on the 21st. 21st, Wednesday? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
that's good. That I think that gives us time to get the, the union contacted and then any final uh, Now, will they be at the, they won't have to be here this next week. You're just going to present this back to us, and then there will be another one set up with the union and, and everything. Yes, sir. Be and because, uh, you know, I'd like, I want, I have not talked, I've sent this to the sheriff's uh, lawyer. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk to him about it. So, you know, there's, whenever you settle a case, there's always a few back and forths on some language and wording. So, <coughs> I don't, I expect that I got a little more work to do on this yet. Wednesday the 21st would be good, especially if what we could do before then, if you want to move more rapidly on the raise, we could get, um, I mean, at this point, even though I disagree with this union letter in terms of, I think its sufficiency is questionable, I think it would probably bind these, the union to not oppose the 56 cent raise for the, the employees that we talked about, boxes four and five. Um, so if, if, you, if, uh, if I need to communicate with them to facilitate that, I'm happy to do that rapidly like this week. But again, I'm, how, what, what, how much notice do you need for meetings? 48 hours 48 to post. Hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. We try not to do that, but sometimes okay. it's just not, a, it's unavoidable. So would you want to try and push this for a, a Wednesday or Thursday this week, or should we try to do it all in one next Wednesday? Uh, yeah, I'd go that route, I think. I'm, okay. I'm fine. Okay. Um, I'd prefer to take care of it as soon as possible, but I think it should be more fully noticed the next week okay. is fine. Okay. So, paragraph 10. The Broadwater County Sheriff's Office agrees to dismiss with prejudice all charges and claims related to the 2015 Broadwater County budget, the October 6, 2014 budget resolution, and all related matters and processes against the commission and all officers, employees, departments, representatives, or subdivisions of Broadwater County. So that's that would be the settlement of the of their case that they, they filed. The commission agrees to forego and waive any back wage claims, whether known or unknown, against the Broadwater County Sheriff Office or any of its employees related to this matter. This waiver does not include a claim for back wages or return payment unrelated to this lawsuit. So paragraphs 10 and 11 are the mutual settlement provision um, where it's kind of like six and seven, they go together and that's that's in order to bring this thing to finality. Is, are we okay with those? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Paragraph 12. The commission agrees to pay the reasonable attorney fees and costs incurred by Broadwater County Sheriff's Office for the prosecution of this lawsuit within the two years allowed by Montana Code 29317 and subject to approval by the Montana District Court under 29314. The Sheriff's Office agrees that the commission may pay the fees out of its various funds as provided by 29316. This one has a few, a few, has several aspects to it. To, to begin with, um, under 29317. Under 2-9-317, it says, it says, except as provided in another chapter which doesn't apply here, if a governmental entity pays a judgment within two years after the day on which the judgment is entered, no penalties or interest may be assessed against the governmental entity. The reason for that is they're supposed to give you another budget cycle to pay that money. This isn't a judgment. This would be an agreement to pay fees. So it wouldn't apply here unless, unless we went to court and lost and we're ordered to pay attorney's fees. The, the point, though, is the statute provides that governments that pay attorney's fees don't have to do it immediately. And frankly, what it is, is it's nothing but a bargaining chip. It's a bargaining chip for state lawyers like me to fight over attorney's fees and say, we're not going to just come in and bankroll you and then pay it in 30 days or start paying interest. And that, that's, that's kind of what it's intended. 2-9-314 says that um, when you sue the state and you are um, ordered to pay attorney's fees, that you actually are supposed to present, here's what my hourly rate is, here's what my costs were, here's my hours, it's part of the public record, and the court 
can approve them or the court can say, no, we are not paying. I think it's unreasonable to pay this lawyer $350 an hour. The court will award $200 an hour or something like that. Again, not necessarily part of the agreement because this would be a, a settlement, not a judgment. The reason I brought them up is because I, well, back to this issue of attorney's fees, uh, it just it just grates in any lawyer when they have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. It's just the, the worst of the worst. And so if the commission decides to pay attorney's fees and it's necessary to, to finalize the budget, then uh, you know I'll, I'll draft it accordingly. What I, what I would recommend is, it, is at a minimum though, number one, these provisions don't need to be in there, but I wanted to be able to talk to you about them. And number two, um, we should actually look at the bill. Uh, the, the last bill that I have, and, and I've, I've emailed for the, the most current, and I don't have it yet, but I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be coming. But the, the last one I have is actually from before your approval meeting. It would have been November, apologize, I've got a lot of stacks here. November 15th, or sorry, December 15th, for $13,600. And so, then the number will be higher than that, because the lawyer, at least she was here on the 22nd, and I know she did a lot of work prepping for that, so the number's higher than that. I've heard fifteen dollars to $17,000. I think I was in the discussion on the video. You're right, because we agreed to pay that at the time. We knew it was $13,000, but there's going to be more on top of that. And we already agreed to pay. One of the things that concerns me is that this case is about the budget resolution from October 6th, okay? The cause of action basically became ripe that day. So the first thing I would do in representing a client in a battle over attorney's fees like this is say, don't pay a dime before October 6th, 2014, because that's representation for something else. It's not this case. Now, that may or may not be accurate because usually when you go to litigation, you know you're going to litigation and you're prepping for litigation. And so there may be some prep prior to October 6, 2014 that reasonably would be part of this case. Going all the way back to, say, April, and there's stuff in here from April. In April, the commission was trying to resolve the deputy pay issue by pursuing an interlocal agreement with the city of Townsend, and that ultimately was unsuccessful. However, those were efforts towards resolving the illegal status of the deputy's pay that were unfruitful because of things outside of your control. So in the world of equity, I don't know that a court would say, yeah, you still have to pay those fees, even though what you were trying to do at that time was fix the problem that was the problem. Um, there's some discussion about whether there was whether there was a representation needed for a fraud investigation. Well, if that's the case, and I don't know, and I'm not even going to hazard an opinion on that, but if that is the case, the statute specifically says counties do not indemnify your employees for any representation for an allegation uh, for fraud. So there are some categories of fees here that if I'm doing my job for you, then I'm saying we need to look at these fees. Other side of the coin on this is your, our goal here is to put some of these issues to rest and to rebuild some relationships and have a unified county government. So every other hour of the day when I'm not here doing this, I'm in there and I'm working with the sheriff's office and we're working well together and my goal is to work very well together and, and uh, have very good cooperative relationships. So I'm in a bit of a pickle here because I'm standing here representing you, my client, saying you need to be tough on these attorney's fees. And then I'm going to walk out the door and I'm going to work with the sheriff's office and say, hey, you guys, work with me and trust me. So, uh, you know, full disclosure to everybody, but, but I can tell you that uh, in in the civil litigation world, you should never just roll over and say, we pre-approve attorney's fees up front, no matter what the number, no matter when it was incurred, no matter what it was for. Um, Did the judge say that? 
that written and somebody were to pay attorney fees. Again, that, that doesn't matter. That was not a that was not an order based on the merits or the, the resolution of the argument. It was it was a, it was summoning us to court to explain ourselves or if we failed to do that then to pay. But it was not a final resolution on the merits. So so um, the final thing I would say is ordinarily whenever someone asking for attorney's fees, they're usually asking for a reimbursement. The client went and they paid a lawyer and they fought this long thing and they won and justice prevailed and the state had to pay their lawyer's fees. Well, they've been paying their lawyer all along. They're just now getting reimbursed for what they've already put out of their pocket. Uh, based on the fact that we have some warrants sitting